Amen. Daniel 6. We have a new empire that is dominating the city of Babylon that took over in chapter 5. You remember in chapter 5, Belshazzar's feast, the handwriting on the wall, how that Daniel was called in to interpret the writing. He told him that the kingdom has been divided and will be given to the Medes and the Persians. And that um, verse 30 of Daniel 5, that very night Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, was slain when the Medes and the Persians took over the empire. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom being 62 years old. And so we see here uh, uh, the rising of another nation or another empire taking over the Babylonians. And the Babylonians fell because of their wickedness and because of the prophecy that was made when Daniel was young to Nebuchadnezzar, younger I should say, that there would be nations that follow Babylon. The Medo-Persian, the Macedonian, the Roman And then in the period of the Roman Empire, God would set up His kingdom, the church, that would never be destroyed. In Daniel chapter 6, you have um, an incident in which we see Daniel as an old man. In chapter 5, he was an old man, but in chapter 6, he's an old man as well. Probably some have estimated to be in his 80s, perhaps even 90s. And it's the famous story of Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, There are some things in the prophets that are very simple that children understand and very profound things. And that's what you find in the book of Daniel. Very simple things and very profound things. And here you're going to see, once again, Daniel's willingness to take a stand. And that started all the way back to chapter 1 when he was young. That he was willing to not give in to the pressures of being like everyone else. And that stuck with him throughout his life. Daniel chapter 6 and verse 1, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give an account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Satrap was a type of official within the government there in the Medo-Persian Empire. And uh, Daniel was one of the three governors over them. Again, Daniel, a very old man at this time. Uh, He had survived the takeover of the city of Babylon, which happened uh, when Belshazzar was killed. And in verse 3, this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. Again, this sounds very much like what you find in the earlier part of the book of Daniel, in which these three friends of his, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel were set over the people because of how outstanding these men were. The governor and the satraps had one that stood out among them all, and that was Daniel. He had an excellent spirit that was in him. Now, let's talk about that for a moment when it comes to Christianity. How will that manifest itself in our life today uh, as far as having an excellent spirit in us among the world. When we're in the world and, and among those who are not Christians, how will having an excellent spirit manifest itself? What, what will be the fruit of it?
Exactly. Being a light uh, to the world, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount that you let your work your light sh- so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Um, how about in the workplace? I mean, you could say that he is in the workplace uh, being one of the governors. Uh, having that excellent spirit in him. We have in that excellent spirit, we will be different, distinguished from the world. Yes. Oh, I thought you had your hand up. Just scratching the neck. Yes. Right. Right. Letting things uh, uh, get get uh, you flustered to the point of uh, harming you physically, things like that. Um, um, having having an attitude of, you know, being in control, things of that nature. Yes. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. It can it can work in reverse in the sense of if the the uh, company you work for is corrupt and has corrupt leaders and corrupt uh, uh, supervisors, things of that nature that. If you don't go along with their corruption, you could you could pay the price for it. And um, we're going to see here in chapter six a conspiracy to to trap Daniel uh, by the his wicked comrades, so to speak. Uh, verse four says, "So the governors and the satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could not find no charge or fault because he was faithful." nor was there any error or fault found in him. Here's an, an outstanding and excellent example of an individual. No fault found in him, no, no uh, error found in him. Now, does that mean he never sinned? How do you know that? Where does it say that? That's good, good answer. Somewhere in the New Testament. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all sinned, so we know it's not talking about that. There's only one who's lived sinlessly, and that's Jesus. But here's a man who's outstanding. He has no outstanding faults or any outstanding errors. He is outstanding in his faithfulness. And really, when you, when you look also and apply this to the concept of an elder in the, Old, in the New Testament... Uh, and a man that's going to be an elder should be without fault or blameless, the Bible says. And that means there's no outstanding faults, no outstanding things in their life that would disqualify them from being a shepherd over God's people. And uh, that's getting harder and harder to find in the brotherhood. And uh, that's unfortunate. But uh, here you have a man that's doing it. And what, again, I've emphasized this before. What does this prove? You can be faithful to God in a wicked society. The Babylonians were a wicked people. Daniel was faithful. The Medo-Persians, they're not much better than the Babylonians. But Daniel was faithful. You don't have to be like everyone else. You don't have to be like society. And if you're not, you'll stand out. You'll be different. And this is what we see with Daniel. 
Verse 5, these men said, we shall, find, we, shall find, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So here the enemies are, and here Daniel, you know, in a sense, minding his own business. Uh, just being a good official within the Middle persian Empire. And here the enemies are trying to form this conspiracy against him. They can't find anything wrong in him. So he, they said the only thing that we can find is something concerning the law of his God. Verse 6. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors... Of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Does this not ring like something that you heard earlier in the book of Daniel? How about Daniel chapter 3 when the image was set up? If you don't fall down and worship the image, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And here you have, they're saying, let's make a petition, let's make this law, that no one makes a petition to any god or man for 30 days except you. Verse 8. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. When in the Medo-Persian Empire, when they would sign a decree, that was it. It cannot be changed. The king can't even go back on his word. If he puts it, writes it, signs the decree, puts it out there, it is law that cannot be altered. And so here, here you see the wickedness of the enemies of God's people conspiring against him. We can't find anything against this person. And doesn't Peter tell us in 1 Peter that we're to live in such a way that when those speak against us, they have nothing to say? They have nothing, they have really nothing against us at all. Yes? Right. Exactly. Very good example. Right. Luke chapter 1 and verse 6, talking about Zacharias and Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So, I mean, that's just proof positive that you can obey God's will. If you want to obey God's will, you can obey God's will you can keep his commandments and Daniel is doing this and um, they have this conspiracy against him they say okay if we make this petition we know Daniel he's not going to pray to Darius we know him he's not going to do this so when he goes and he prays to his God he'll be breaking this law and then we'll have him which shows how wicked people are when uh, they hate you and uh, you can even be perfect and they're still going to hate you. Look at Jesus. He was perfect and they hated him. And they put him to death. Verse 9, Therefore the king, uh, king Darius, signed the written decree. He's going to regret this later on. Verse 10, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home and in his upper room with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as was his custom since early days. See, since his early days, since the early days of his life, what he did as a young person is sticking with him in his old age. He laid the foundation for his life when he was young. That's why it's important to seek the Lord. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. As Solomon says in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12. We need to be remembering God when we're young. 
and it will stick with us throughout the rest of our life. We, we set out to serve God and put Him first as young people. Right. Right. Well, he seemed, he seemed, though, to be the only person he had to worry about was himself. That, that might be the only difference. You know, it was just him. There's no mention of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They could have been dead by now. Um, it might have just been him, and he just said, whatever happens to me happens. I mean, I'm just guessing. But that's a very good point. He did not alter his, his behavior at all. Not one whit. He knew that the that had been signed and he went about to do exactly what he'd always done and um, he knew the consequences that he would face verse 11 then these men assembled and found daniel praying and making supplication before his god so they said oh we we've got him we've got him now uh, how many christians would change their behavior if they 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 found themselves under threat uh, of the government uh, because of praying to God or, or doing what we're doing this morning, which is so many brethren throughout the world, they don't have this freedom to do what we're doing. Um, I talked to a Chinese uh, lady that married an American missionary down in Bayside when it was on uh, the gospel meeting down there. And uh, she had been a Christian for 10 years in China. And she talked about how that they would have to say that they're going to have a get-together. And they would have a get-together to worship God. Because if they openly spoke about it, they could be arrested. They could be uh, put on trial. They could not openly walk around with a Bible. There's a state religion there in China. Of course, it's run by the Chinese government. But the Lord's Church is illegal. So they'd have to say, we're, you know, we're having a, a get-together. And so the difficulties that our brethren face throughout the world, we have to realize and cherish these freedoms that we have and pray that they continue, not only for us, but for our children and grandchildren if the world stands. And so we see here the men assembled together, and they found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Verse 12, And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree that, have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast in the den of the lions? And by the way, Daniel could have said, you know, I'll just wait 30 days. It'll be over with in 30 days. Besides, I could just pray silently. God could hear my prayers. Nope, he didn't reason that way. He said, I'm not going to alter my behavior for this he could have waited it out 30 days well he didn't do it the king answered and said the thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians which cannot alter which does not alter so they answered and said before the king that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah does not show due regard for you O king or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. So here you see these wicked individuals saying, well, this Daniel, which is one of the captives of Judah, still that, that, that uh, dispersion that's being uh, cast upon him. He's, he's being referred to as a captive of Judah. He's 80 or 90 years old. He was captured when he was probably a teenager. But they have that prejudice, that captive of Judah. They should have been respecting him. He was one of the governors. But they call him a captive of Judah. Does not show uh, due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. 
as the apostle said in Acts chapter 5, we ought to obey God rather than man. When they were told, don't preach anymore, I said, we've got to do it. We've got to obey God rather than man. Yes, go ahead. Right. Right. I didn't catch that. That's very good. All of them. Everybody's on board with this. <laughs> well, Daniel wasn't. Daniel wasn't on board with this. See how people exaggerate? People will exaggerate. You know, that's a form of dishonesty. Exaggerating. And, and everybody, everybody. Uh, thinks this way. Well, not everyone does. Daniel certainly didn't. He wasn't going to agree to that. But that's a very good point. Verse 14, And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly dis- displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. He was displeased. He was disappointed in himself. He did not realize what this was going to do to Daniel. Evidently, Darius had a a care for Daniel, a respect for Daniel. And he realized this was going to happen, and and he was disappointed with himself, displeased with himself. And he was trying to find a loophole, trying to find a loophole in the law to get Daniel out of this situation. Verse 15, Then these men approached the king and said to the king, No, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. See how they try to make themselves sound so noble? This This is the law of the land. This is the right thing to do. You signed it, O king. It can't be... Human nature hasn't changed one bit. You see that in society. You see that in politics. You see that in the church. They're holding it over him. Look, you signed this under... uh, Do what? Now follow through. You've got to do this now. Oh, it's just amazing how that human nature hasn't changed, even though society does from time to time. So they're holding him to to his word. The, The law of the Medes and the Persians, that no creed, uh, decree rather, or statute which the king established may be changed. Verse 16, so the king gave the command, they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of the lion. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. So here you see uh, Darius having a, a faith in the God of Daniel. But as we talked about Daniel chapter 3, how that there was no indication to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that they were going to be delivered. They said, God can if He wants to. He can deliver us from your hand, Nebuchadnezzar. But if He doesn't, we're still not going to worship your image. Where here you have Daniel being uh, cast into the den of the lions. And Darius is saying, Your God, whom you serve continually, He will deliver you. Do you think that Darius may have had some records which talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That there might have been something on record for him to look back on and say, there's been deliverance before. So there could have been an understanding there that, hey, the God of of Daniel is able to deliver. He's able to do this. Verse 17, Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it, with his own signet ring and with the sig- signets of his lords that the purpose that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed so they they put a seal on it they sealed it up you don't break the seal and therefore uh, the the enemies of God there who hated Daniel and think about this how much damage to all of those governors Could an 80 or 90 year old man do to them? What kind of threat would Daniel be to all those governors 
and all of those satraps and all of those officials. I mean, Daniel is just minding his own business, so to speak, and serving his God, and they hate him. Exactly. His only threat, that's, that's the point, his only threat was he outshined them, made them look bad because of their wicked behavior. Exactly. Right. Slackers. Exactly. If you, if you have a, a, a company or a, a place of business and it has uh, um, ten workers in it and you have one hard worker, the other nine are going to look bad. And so they, that, that person will outshine the rest of them. Yes. Exactly. A very good point. Very good point with Esther there. Uh, his, their pride wounded. It hurt them. Um, I mean, just the, the example that you set, you know, um, just causes others that are in wickedness to despise you. Well, they think that he's out of the way. Uh, verse 18. By the way, it's interesting foreshadowing. Who else had a stone rolled in front of a door and they thought he was out of the way? Christ. They thought he was gone forever. Verse 18. Now the king went to his place and spent the night fasting. No musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. This king very much cares for Daniel. Verse 19. And the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions, and when he had come to the den, he cried with, uh, with a lamentation, lam, lamenting voice to Daniel. And the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. Don't you know that uh, when he heard that voice out of that den that made Darius feel so much better. O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. I didn't do you any wrong. I didn't do God any wrong. God has sent his angel. Very similar to the deliverance of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Verse 23. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. No injury whatsoever was found on him because he believed in his God. Uh, an amazing rescue once again. But notice here, God delivers from the the problems that they faced. He does not take away the problems. He delivers from the problem. And this difficulty he had to face, he had to be put in there. Again, there's nothing that indicated to Daniel that I could see in the text that God spoke to Daniel and said, I'm going to rescue you from this. Daniel could have very well thought, okay, this is it. You know, I'm 80, 90, you know, however old he was. And this is, this is it for me. Uh, but God had a usefulness for him still in this life and rescued him from the lion's mouth and was uh, giving a sign to Darius that he is the one true living God. Just as he delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that was a sign to Nebuchadnezzar that he was the true and living God. And so this made an impact on uh Darius, and he makes a decree that's very similar to Nebuchadnezzar's decree that no one's to speak against the God of Daniel. Verse 24, And the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and cast them 
into the den of lions. See how God is able to turn the tables on things? Them, their children, their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Ripped them to pieces. See, you reap what you sow. Verse 25, And King Darius wrote to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He, has del- he delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. In verse 28. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. It would be under Cyrus that the people get to go back home. The people who were still alive and the newer ones that were born after the 70-year captivity would get to go back home. Now, I want you to think about this. This decree, a decree that was very similar, written by Nebuchadnezzar, uh, making a decree that no one is to speak against the, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Menigo. And then you have what... Uh, Nebuchadnezzar wrote concerning his own humiliation in Daniel chapter 4 and how that there is uh, a God in heaven. Does this seem like that perhaps Darius may have been converted as Nebuchadnezzar perhaps might have been converted? That he now is a believer in the one true and living God? And how much of an impact this made on the people of that area? Because think about this. The wise men that came to visit Christ when he was born, where did they come from? From the east. From the east, Persia, that area. There was a respect and an expectation of a coming Messiah among the Jewish people but not only the Jewish people but also the Gentiles and the wise men however many they were three or however many we know more than one at least and then when Christ was born they came from the east from this area because there was a respect for the Jewish scriptures and the Jewish uh, people I think in great deal because of people like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and Daniel. The influence that they had, especially Daniel. Do you think about the impact of just a few people on world events? A few people. And we need to think about that when we think about what impact we can make in people's lives and the impact that we can make in this community because we're not big in number. But it's not that which makes the difference. It's what we do with what we have. The impact. There were people who came from the east, wise men from the east, to come and see the Christ child. And I believe it was because of the influence of people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Exactly. The potency of something small. That's very good. That's a very good uh, illustration. The potency of something small. It's not the amount of it. It's the potency of it. And what it can do to to help out a, a situation. And so we need to see this and see the impact that this, uh, this man had. And see the example that it is set forth for us. How that he was willing to stand with God no matter what. Uh, he seems like, like I said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego seem to be out of the picture at this time. Perhaps they're dead. He's by himself, it seems like, but he still stood. God was with him. 
God was with him. God in one person is a majority. And we have to see that. Now, we're going to stop right there in uh, chapter 7. Um, well, I'll tell you what, we got a little bit. Let's kind of introduce what we're getting into in chapter 7. Chapter 7, uh, 8, we're going to see some of the visions that Daniel have that are very similar to the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in showing the, the upcoming empires that were going to uh, come after the Babylonian Empire. Chapter 7, remember this. Chapter 7 is a one-chapter summation of the book of Revelation. Chapter 7 is a one-chapter summation of the book of Revelation. And when we study this, and we're going to tie this more into the book of Revelation, uh, not next week because we have um, our marriage seminar, but in two weeks, we're going to see the similarities there and what this is predicting and how it has fulfillment in the book of Revelation. Look at chapter 7 and verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Now it's going back. Talking about the king of, king of uh, Babylon, Belshazzar. Daniel had a dream and the visions of his head while he was on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night. And behold, the four winds of the heaven were stirring up the great sea. Four great beasts come out of the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus, to it, rise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After that, I saw in a night vision, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. What we're seeing here is what Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. The rise and fall of nations. Verse 4, the lion, that's the Babylonian Empire. We'll go into this in more detail in two weeks. Verse 5, the bear that rises up. That's the Medo-Persian Empire. Verse 6, the leopard is the Macedonian Empire. Swift. Alexander the Cam- Ale- not, not Alexander Campbell, but Alexander the Great was swift in conquering the known world at that time. He was swift. You read history and see his conquest. That's talking about him the leopard. And then verse 7, the fourth beast, which would be what? The Roman Empire. Now this is tied in to the book of Revelation in which it talks about the beast in the book of Revelation. The beast that would persecute the saints. That's the Roman Empire. And that's what we're going to see when we get into that chapter and then that book. So what we're seeing here are some of the visions that we uh, have uh, come across before just in a different way when Nebuchadnezzar saw that dream of the statue starting with the head going all the way down to the toes. Babylon, Medo-Persian, uh, Macedonian, and then the Roman Empire. And so we see these being set forth here as animals and uh, different aspects of them to describe different aspects of that empire. And we're going to see how that um, the horns have significance. The horns that speak 
pompous things has significance. Uh, how that the, the horn on this beast will be speaking blasphemous words. Just a preview of that. I was talking about the Roman emperors who wanted to be worshipped. Those Roman emperors loved to think of themselves as gods. And they wanted worship. And they wanted everyone in their empire to worship them. And the Christians would not do that. Therefore, they were persecuted. So that's a little preview. And that gives us a backdrop and background to the book of Revelation, which we will go into and tie it all together, uh, Lord willing, in the future. So um, be studying Daniel chapter 7. It has 28 verses in it. But study it, look at it, analyze it. And in two weeks, Lord willing, we will get into this, some of the most fascinating prophecies that you'll come across in the prophets.